Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. We're in a different location this week. Secret. Uh, secret location. It's actually one of our houses. You guess which one. Yeah. I think by the pinball machine, yeah. it's your place it's here. It's my place. And that's because today we're gonna to be talking about something you've been using at home for the past couple months mm -hmm. and we've each been using, which is the Glowforge. The Glowforge, man. The, the laser cutter that was finally for me. Right, well, what does that mean, finally, for you? You were in the market to get a laser cutter? I always wanted a laser cutter as soon as I learned about them, just because they're cool, but it wasn't like I actually made something that needed a laser cutter, which was this thing called the Game Frame that I put on Kickstarter, and it was, um, it was a laser etching that I designed, but I had outsourced, because I didn't have a laser cutter. Like, mm -hmm. they're tens of thousands of dollars. So I used a service to have this cut, and, uh, you know, that was great. That was great, but had the Glowforge been around, I don't know, maybe I would have used this instead because I certainly paid a lot more than the cost of the Glowforge to have this done. And I didn't have a, the laser cutter afterwards to show for it. And that was the whole promise. Several years ago when Glowforge first announced that they were gonna release this product and, uh, and teased the video, you know, the idea was that you could do laser cutting in the home with a hobby cutter. Now yeah. that means all sorts of things. There's a very big difference between this type of laser cutter and a laser cutter you might find in a makerspace or you might find, you know, imported from China or something. Right. Uh, first of all, this is a glass tube laser. It's not a metal laser, so it's a different type of laser technology. Uh, the power is a little bit different. It's a 40 watt laser mm -hmm. here, 45 watt if you go for the pro model. Which would be like the bare minimum for a pro laser cutter. Which those are around 100 watts. Mm -hmm. uh, but those limitations may be just fine for someone like you or me who are just hobby cutting in the home. And we're not sure of exactly if that's gonna be fine for someone who might want to do some light manufacturing. Right, no, I mean, it, plus the cost, this is a $4,000 laser cutter, which if, when you're comparing that to other maker devices like 3D printers, that's expensive. You compare the cost of a Glowforge to one of these pro models, like Universal, you're talking the, the Glowforge is like a, a quarter the price of that um, for even one of their smaller low-end models. So it's clear that you, both you and I were definitely attracted to this yeah. just from a pricing and economic standpoint. Also convenience, you know? I mean, it has a lot of things built into it that the other guys don't. Right, and we both pre-ordered it and we got ours finally shipped late last year and we've been using it for a couple months now. And so we wanted to share with you some of our learning experiences about what it can and can't do. Yeah, there's definitely a list of pros and cons and both lists are considerable. So first of all, let's talk about setup. One of the advantages of the convenience is that it is a simple setup. You have have your Glowforge set up in your garage, mm -hmm. um, and I have mine actually set up in my home office. Uh, one consideration is gonna be ventilation, probably the biggest consideration. Right, now when they launched their, it wasn't a Kickstarter, they launched their own crowdfunding campaign on their own site. One of the things you could pre-order was their own filtering system. Which and they're hoping to ship sometime this year, they still haven't shipped it yet. I ordered that, because I was thinking I wanted it inside, and that would be nice to have it all self-contained. However, when they were ready to ship, they, ha they aren't ready to ship the filter yet. In fact, they still haven't shipped the filter. So we, we both needed to find a solution to exhaust. And there is a dryer duct vent on the back of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need to find a way to get that out of your house. I put it next to my garage door and I connected a basically a vent to one of the uh, existing holes on my garage door. And I found this cool magnetic uh, contraption that connects this to the uh, to the vent so whenever I want to use it I just slide it and I connect it and it's it's relatively simple yep and then I have it actually just going out my third story window yeah um, through the window with something like a brace so they can doesn't come the fumes don't come back in mm -hmm. with on ventilation as long as you're abiding by rules and keeping it away from your next door neighbors in a well ventilated area um, it's pretty easy. Power, it's just your regular three-prong power outlet. Right. No yeah. special 240 volt adapter, nothing. It's only a 40 watt laser. It runs off a regular power outlet. Um, it, and has, then, it has a cooling for the laser built into it. That's the other thing. As well as the exhaust fan for the exhaust. So it's all yeah. self-contained. Now that you can't get much longer than the hose that comes with it. Right. Uh, with, with the power of the fan that's in there. Uh, so you're talking maybe six feet maximum between your exhaust vent and your and your Glowforge. Which does mean that this has to be set up close to you, relatively close to your exhaust. Right. It can't be on the other side of the room and then wiring this around. Uh, you couldn't 
you know, change out the fan and figure out the CFM without getting some other exhaust assistance. Exactly. Um, and then once it's set up, um, it's really drag and drop was what they had pitched, right? It's a web app. You go to this website, uh, there's nothing to install and you register your Glowforge and then you can start uploading vectors or images. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about some of the things we've made first before we get into what we yeah, think of yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. web app? Absolutely. Um, so uh, I made this thing, which uh, I thought was kind of neat. This is, First of all, we should say from the outset that if you are a maker with a 3D printer, you already know that you would probably love to have a laser cutter because they complement each other so well. And this is an example of that. So this is a miniature pinball machine. I 3D printed the cabinet and then laser cut the glasses, the glass pieces for the uh, you know this part and this part, which you couldn't 3D print that yep. because it wouldn't be clear enough, as well as the play field itself. Um, here they are. So we have these little laser cut play fields that uh, laser cut perfectly on the Glowforge and relatively fast. And then I put a you know circuit board beneath and made them all light up. Um, and it, it was a lot of fun to make that. Of course, you can also do laser etches um, like this, where around the edges here it's been etched. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the two things that a laser cutter can do: it can cut or etch. Um, if you etch into uh, acrylic like this, it then lights up when you apply a light to it. And this is just a base. This cut, I mean, this whole thing probably took, I don't know, like three minutes. Yeah. Uh, it didn't take very long at all. Um, I will say that the etching, though, on the Glowforge is certainly, um, it takes a lot more time than the cuts. Now, that's true of any laser cutter. I think it's especially accentuated on the, on the Glowforge. Right, we're already talking about different materials and different applications. It's not just about cutting outlines of things, designing a vector or downloading a vector and cutting uh, you know, out of your eighth inch ply a uh, silhouette, what you're doing is, the most interesting application is to combine it uh, with 3D printing, combine it with lighting, or something that I've done, design some three-dimensional objects. And so these are all laser cut pieces that then can get registered together yeah. and make a three-dimensional shape. Um, I think these are actually good examples of that. A lot of the laser cut, um, it seems like they took a 3D object and then sliced it into layers. Which is a totally valid way to do it. You know, it's a different aesthetic. It depends that you get into like just taste at that point. But I think these are particularly nice because they just work as laser cuts. Yeah, and then, but designing of these, that's a complicated process. You have to maybe work on some CAD and figure out exactly how the joins are going to work. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting coming when you have a 3D printer compared to a laser cutter. I think a lot of people probably are going to have both. There are hobbyists that are in the 3D D printing scene mm -hmm. and then they go on Thingiverse and they want to download something just to print it. They don't they're not really involved in designing their own things because there's a huge volume of objects that you can download to print. Right. That's not necessarily the case with laser cutters. I think I wouldn't be surprised if laser cutters, the demographic for these, is more really people who are designing their own objects. Yeah. There's not a, a huge uh, you know supply of these type of objects that you've mm -hmm. cut. And it really depends on the complexity of the thing you want to cut. If you just want stencils and outlines, you know, it doesn't take long to learn a vector drawing program. You can get Inkscape yeah. if you are, or you have Adobe Illustrator, and you can do things like I did this, which is just stacked pieces of plywood, and it's on the tested set, but it's just two and a half D. Right. right? It's just stacks of 2D and getting an alignment and using different materials mm -hmm. and doing a little painting, and it has a good effect. Or uh, if you want to use different material, like this took five minutes to design, and then cut on felt, and it's a little piece of art. The shining, yeah, shining uh, carpet. Carpet, yeah, yeah. And it's it not doesn't take a lot to design this. And you can even use web-based tools like Tinkercad to draw your outlines and export those out as vector files to put um, in the Glowforge or any laser cutter. Right. So speaking of materials, the one of the ways that Glowforge is a little bit different from other companies is they sell their own materials. Now it's kind of a razor blade kind of you know system where you buy the, uh, the the laser cutter, but then you're also going back to them to buy more materials. You don't have to use materials. No, of course not, but but, but they, they build in some benefits. Yeah, exactly. The, what they sell is what they call proof grade, and they sell felts and plywoods and draft wood and, and acrylic and all kinds of things. Um, and they include these barcodes on them. They come in usually two thicknesses which is like a thick and a, and a medium, and this, not barcode, but a QR code, which is, which is kind of interesting because you put this into the Glowforge and it knows what it is because the Glowforge has two cameras in it. So not only can you see on a laptop what's in your bed, but the Glowforge itself can read the material and it has the preset settings, it knows how to cut, it knows how to etch, 
Does it require any fiddling or testing on your part? So that's based on their database of materials. Um, you can't unfortunately add your own database, but you can pull their proof grade presets if you're using your own materials. You can insist that it is proof grade. Even now, though they may not see the, bar, the QR code. Yeah, now I mean that is one of my biggest complaints about this is there is no way currently to store your own settings. So if you yeah. have your own materials that you brought to the table, put it in there and you've tested it, you found out what the etch settings should be, what the cut settings should be, you have to write that down in a notebook and next time you use it, type it in again, like buy it from scratch. And that is just a waste of time. Yeah, and also it's relying on the consistency of their materials. Now the pricing for the proof grade sheets, I think it's reasonable, about 10 to $12 for a 12 by 20 sheet of ply. Yeah. It's nicely finished ply, mm -hmm. and of course it has the plastic coating that, which prevents scorching, mm -hmm. which I think is incredibly important if you want nice finishes. And Almost, they've tested like the, the type of glues that are used inside sure. them so that they're all laser safe. Yeah. Uh, before you dive into this world, you should definitely know that you shouldn't laser cut just everything, mm -hmm. because a lot of things are made with materials that once they become burned, they release gases that are harmful. I will say having bought several stacks of the proof grade materials, there is a, few, a little bit of inconsistency. Mm. One or two times, some of the sheets I've had have a little bit of warping in them, and occasionally they're uneven enough so that when I use that proof grade setting, it doesn't cut all the way through, mm. or maybe all the backing sheet doesn't get cut through, and I have to do a little bit of punching out. Right. Yeah, so your experience may vary. What I typically do is do proof grade and then increase my power by two or three percent, just to or be slow sure. it down by two or three percent. I haven't found any downside to cutting slower. Uh, mm -hmm. other than the time that it takes. Like yeah. it, it doesn't seem to cause much more damage to the material, it's just a, a factor of time. Speaking of the razor blade model, another thing they do is they have a store for assets, for the things that, designs for you to cut. Right, this is, this is, this is a strange thing. So no one else is doing this, I, I'm proud that they're experimenting, but I don't think it's a good idea. They have this store where you can buy various things to cut on your uh, laser cutter. And you buy them in two tiers. You can pay the cheap price and you cut it once, or you buy, pay the expensive price and you can cut it as many times as you want. However, you do not get the files. Nope. You have to cut it on your Glowforge. And I question whether or not people spending $4,000 are even in it to for that reason. I think most people are gonna design their own things. If you're going to give me things that can only be cut on a Glowforge, fine, but just give them to me and I will probably buy proof grade materials to cut them on. Yeah, so let's talk about some limitations. We talked about the app, uh, mm -hmm. everything is done through this web app, which also means this has to be internet connected. Exactly, so yeah. a lot of, like that may not be what you're looking for. Um, yeah. This is the first laser cutter I've ever heard of that requires that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you get all the benefits of that, meaning user friendliness, the access to their database. Automatic updates. You go to one computer, you go to another, all your projects are there stored in the cloud. However, you cannot cut something unless you have internet connectivity. And it's not about speeds either. It being connected to internet, even if you're in a slower connection, the files and the information goes to your Glowforge relatively quickly. It's more about just the reliability. Sometimes the servers may be overloaded. I've had definitely times where I've had to turn off the Glowforge and turn it back on to recalibrate. Hmm. And so there are minor frustrations here and there on the fact that it is internet connected, but there is versatility as well in that any computer I have, even my smartphone, I can load up that web app and look at my designs and, and start a cut. Yeah, and while they are improving the web app uh, every month, uh, there's new updates to it, it still feels a little bit restricted. It's still, basic. It's it still feels very basic. There, there's, For instance, there's no way to cut something. You can't draw a line and have your material cut in half or you know, shaped no in any shape or form without actually providing that file. Like all I want from this material, from this tool sometimes is a line. I just want to drag a line on the screen and draw it down and say, cut here, please. No, I have to go in Illustrator. I have to create a file that is a single line. I have to export that as, a, as in an EPS. A EV SVG. SVG, and then I upload that, and it's just, that's just a, that seems like, uh, that should be there. I, every Glowforge owner now, I bet, has a repository of their basic yeah. primitives, a, a circle, a, a rectangle, a line, mm -hmm. just so they can drag it in and cut out lines, right? And I wish they had that basic functionality. I know it's not what they're in the business of doing, but it's a thing that makes makes the experience feel a little bit like it's in beta yeah. still. I mean, it only was recently that they added the feature to save your arrangement of items. If I import a SVG and have something like this where I want to conserve my material and, and uh, or jigsaw puzzle it yeah. so it's all tight. Previously, to a month ago, it wouldn't save that arrangement. 
I don't have to do it every time I made that cut. And now they finally have the ability to, to save all your changes. Yeah. Uh, the interface though, it's pretty fast. You can use a mouse, you can use a keyboard. Sure. It has basic Adobe Illustrator style. There's undo. Undo, control Z, you can scale up, scale down. All your shortcuts are there. And you can you know, import a vector and then add to the vector with another raster image. You can even take the camera image, update that. Um, Cause that's one of the abilities that this has because of the two camera system is that it can take a picture of your material and then create what it thinks is the raster based on that or an outline even. Right, no, that's actually one of the neat features. I don't think anyone else does that either. And so that makes it extremely accessible. Like while I can't cut a line without assistance of dropping in a file, I can actually cut out objects. Like my uh, 10 year old wanted to make uh, Nerf targets. Yeah. So I 3D print some stands and then he drew these cardboard shapes, very basic shapes on with a Sharpie on a piece of cardboard, we dropped it in there and it cut out the shape and we dropped it you know, right onto the stand. So that's the kind of thing that makes it accessible for even children to use, which it sounds crazy for a laser cutter. It, it really cuts that workflow pipeline. Like technically I could have taken a smartphone picture of the drawing, imported it into Photoshop, right. traced it, but it automates that and it gets you from doing something with your hands to having a tangible cut piece of material uh, very quickly. Now I will say the accuracy of the cut lines, the alignment, the alignment works well directly under the camera, but the further out you go in your material, the worse it gets. And it gets to be, you know, a good quarter inch off by the time you re reach the extremity. There's definitely this lens warping that they haven't exactly compensated that for. Also, seems like it should be something that can be solved in software. If you look at the Glowforge forums, many people are devising their own ways to recalibrate and create basically small jigs so they know their image is always gonna be offset wow, by this wow. much, yeah. this far away from the center of the camera. Yeah. And that's just unfortunate that it's not perfectly calibrated. The, the normal use of that camera though, while I've actually only used this auto etching feature this one time, it's not something I'm using all the time, but I'm using that camera all the time whenever I go to cut something. I love being able to drop a used piece of material in there and have the camera image show up on my laptop and then I put my cut in the unused area. I mean, that's really convenient. As long as it's close to the center yeah. of that then, camera. Then you can trust it. Right, yeah. and that's where if I, you put the piece of uncut proof grade material in, cut in the center, and then guess what? You don't have a piece in the center anymore. You have to work <laughs> right. off the edges. Yeah. And the edges are also where there are some limitations. This material is 20 by 12 inches, and this whole bed in here can fit around something 20 inches wide to up to 18 inches deep, but your actual cuttable area is about an inch in. On both from, sides. All, all sides. sides. So you're really only gonna be able to cut about between 10 inches and 18 inches, which leaves you a lot of extra wasted material on the outside, which you don't sometimes even see in the app. I think I'm pushing it all the way to zero, zero in the top corner, Yeah. but then I'm, I have this big border. The and app doesn't really even show you the whole material. No, yeah. yeah, I want to. it makes me want to cut these material sheets in half and just use them in the center. Mm. And it makes me like think that this is not the full bed that I was promised. Yeah, what was extra confusing about that is we had an early version of this almost a year ago, mm -hmm. more than that, I think, and we we thought that they were going to fix that. Like yeah. that was all that was a limitation then that we understood was something that would be solved for the shipping version. And for some reason, that hasn't been solved. Yeah. So I don't know if it's a software thing. It definitely doesn't feel like it's a limit of the gantry system. Yeah. Like the laser can looks like it can go all the way to the edge, but the material is not the biggest thing that you can cut. It's much. It's a little bit smaller. Right. Than that. Uh, and then you talk about speeds. You know, if you compare this to a professional laser cutter, it is much slower, both in the vector and especially in the raster. Oh my gosh. And one of the limitations is that actual raster and cut time. Mm -hmm. The size of the project, the maximum size of the project, isn't limited by the file size or necessarily how big of a thing you're cutting. It's actually how long of a cut, the, the, the cut time or the raster time it takes. And while you can do rasters up to like three hours long, Anything bigger than that, and sometimes you do need something bigger than that, uh, for me it just fails. Was that almost the size of the entire material? I, I tried to do as big as possible, wow. with as much detail as possible, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I had it running. And it has to be internet connected that whole time. I, I think if the files are too long, it actually streams down the project in batches. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There's no way to press the button and say, pause and turn it off and resume right. later. And 
unlike a 3D printer, although some people would say, say even a 3D printer, you don't want to leave this unattended. No, if you, it, if you shouldn't. If you're laser cutting, you're talking about the potential for flames at all time, and you want to make sure that you are aware of what's happening on the bed. I mean, we're listing out all these caveats because we think they are things you should know if you're looking to spend $4,000 on a laser cutter. And yes, there is the Pro model, which you'll have to be able to pass through wood, but that feature isn't even enabled yet, so I don't think you should spend that money because that's a couple thousand dollars more. But the caveat's important because we actually use this. Mm -hmm. Like the, the great thing about this is that it's in an accessible, you can put it in an accessible place and you can actually get stuff done. You can, I'm, I'm like, regardless of the frustrations I have with this, of having to turn it off and reset it and recalibrate and, and the limitations of material size, I've made more stuff because I have it. And, and no question, there are definitely caveats. And I am frustrated with the web app, uh, but this is, no question, I am so happy with this product. The fit and finish of the actual product itself is gorgeous. I love being of look, looking at it. It's almost like Apple-ish in that way. Mm. I'm very happy with the, the form of it, the detail, the level of uh, care that they took, even with like the way that the LED lights mm -hmm. lay inside, uh, the hinge that keeps the door open when I raise it, uh, the way that you can clean the bed. It's all very well thought out. Uh, and it is definitely the one you know that I'm happy with, that I'm happy with. I am very happy with this purchase because it is so easy to use. Uh, uploading a file, printing it, it is uh, it's just that level of user friendliness that has not had not existed until this product came along. It makes laser cutting accessible. Yeah, it makes it accessible. It really is convenient, and while it may not be the most powerful or mo most robust laser cutter, even in the glass laser cutter. Arena, there are some competitors that can do more offline. Yeah. Um, it's the one that if you, if you value convenience, you value getting stuff done, um, this is one that we're very happy yeah, with. Yeah, and you mentioned the time it takes to do the etches. That can be very, very long, but it's only long compared to the pro grade stuff. And if you don't have any experience with that, it's like you don't even know what you're missing. <laughs> compared to 3D printing, everything you do on a, this laser cutter is going to be miles of faster than, than a 3D print takes. We talk about choosing the right tools for the right job when we're making things and having a laser cutter in your tool set, much like having a 3D printer in your tool set was something that we could not conceive of having available in the home five years ago. Yeah. And the fact that that's a reality today is something we're still constantly blown away by. So hopefully you learn a little bit about the Glowforge if you're still um, on the fence about whether to invest in one. It is an investment at $4,000. They say that they're shipping and they've almost completed all of their domestic pre-orders hmm. and they're getting the figure out international. Uh, so if you're in the US, if you pre-order, hopefully it won't be too long before you get your own. If you have additional questions about the Glowforge or if you'd like to see things we test cut, uh, please post a comment in the comment section below. We'll be continuing to use ours for sure. Um, and we'll see you next time.